I'm Jay Kriegel, and it's a particular pleasure for me to be able to introduce Kurt Anderson, which Ben asked me to do. Uh, Kurt is the ultimate multitasker. He's not just accomplished, but an all-star at countless disciplines. A Nebraska-born three-time novelist, and as his current book, Fantasyland, shows, a brilliant historian. A Brooklyn-based writer for stage, screen, TV, books, and magazines, host of the always creative, frequently exciting Studio 360, and P PRI and NPR's window into all things culture, with culture defined in the widest possible way. Imagine a man whose favorite pastime is dreaming of time travel. Husband to the glorious Ann Kramer, who and a man who describes his love for his two daughters as the faith of his life. Kurt is one of our great humorists, who long ago at the cutting edge spy magazine coined the still devastating label, short fingered vulgarian, to describe the Donald. That one will last forever. And he is always provocative, and he will be today when he speaks about his, his work, Fantasyland, which traces 500 years of American history to achieve what the esteemed Walter Isaacson calls the indispensable explanation of the post-truth age of Trump. It is filled with revelations and surprise, especially how the familiar protest movements of the 60s led to this post-truth era. In planning this session, we faced a daunting task of finding a moderator who was equally knowledgeable and talented. It was not so easy. We were frustrated and baffled, so Ben and Donna consulted our Google Muse, and lo and behold, it spewed out just one name as qualified, the very same Kurt Anderson. <laughs> so for this session, uniquely at Kent Presents, we concluded that only Kurt Anderson has the breadth and depth and range to interview himself. So it is my pleasure, before I disappear from the stage, to introduce my dear friend, Kurt, to engage in a rigorous dialogue with himself. Kurt Anderson. That's a whole other shtick premise that I'm really actually not gonna do for you, is introducing myself, but thank you uh, very much, Jay. Uh, it is a pleasure being here in Kent. Uh, uh, very flattered to be invited. Uh, very happy to talk about this subject. And very convenient, because uh, Ann and I uh, have a place 20 minutes away, so uh, when we leave the reservation, we just go home and nap, take off our clothes. Anyhow, uh, how we got to post-truth. Back in 1770, uh, young John Adams said famously, facts are stubborn things, that our wishes and inclinations and the dictates of our passions don't alter the state of facts and evidence. Two and a half centuries after now, this nation that Adams co-founded is becoming a refutation of his truism. As another great American, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to say, you are entitled to your own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. My, um, my old friend Lawrence O'Donnell was one of Senator Moynihan's uh, top aides in the 1980s and 1990s, and I talked to him about this quote that has been attributed to him. He said, yes, I remember when he started saying it in the late 90s, and he said it often. And, and among other of Moynihan's great prescient uh, brilliances, it seems to me, is that he saw before anybody else really did what was beginning to happen to America. In, in, and here we are today with many, many millions of Americans who really do feel entitled to their own facts as well as their own opinions and don't see any difference between fact an opinion and feel free to deny any realities they find inconvenient or troubling. Now, each of us here and everybody we know is on the spectrum somewhere between absolutely rational and, and ludicrously irrational. We all have hunches we can't prove and, and, and superstitions that make no real sense. What's problematic and what Americans have been doing more and more is going overboard letting subjective belief and feelings, truthiness, as Stephen Colbert calls it, entirely override empirical observation and factual understandings. 
Now, what I'm talking about isn't unique to America, people treating real life as fantasy and fantasy as reality and denying important evidence and taking preposterous ideas seriously. That's not unique to us, but we are uniquely immersed in various ways in the developed world. What we used to call, of course, the civilized world. Compared to Canada and the UK and Australia and the two dozen nations of Europe and Japan and others, our predilection is, is unusually deep-seated and extreme in various ways. We are outliers. We are different in the depth and breadth, breadth of our embrace of falsehoods and fantasies of many different kinds. Take, for instance, Donald Trump. I disagree with policies he pushes. I, I, I abhor, I think as most of us probably do, even his supporters, his ugly instincts and manner. But at least as big a problem as all that for me is that he is leading a movement based on utter indifference to distinctions between truth and falsehood. Whether he's lying or simply being false or it's a matter of delusion or wishfulness, it doesn't matter. It is this, this distinction, this important distinction between truth and falsehood that is never easy to make, but we must always strive to make, and we now have a president who is endeavoring not to make that. The Washington Post keeps this running fact check tally of the falsehoods that he has purveyed as president. As of the first of this month, 4,229 as president. And believe it or not, that rate is rapidly uh, getting worse. During his first year in office, he publicly lied or dissembled or fantasized five or six times a day. Bad enough, you might think. But during the last six months, that rate doubled to a dozen t falsehoods a day. And this summer, just June and July, an average of 16 a day or more than 100 falsehoods per week. But my point here today, and the point of the book that Jay so generously alluded to, is that post-factual and post-truth America did not start with Donald Trump's candidacy, with Donald Trump's uh, becoming the poster boy of the invidious, pernicious falsehood and fantasy about Barack Obama's uh, uh, where, where he came from. Um, Donald Trump just opportunistically took advantage of America's special vulnerability to falsehood and fantasy. I was struck, and I quote him in the book, and I talked to him about this, the conservative uh, radio talk show host Charlie Sykes, who said last year that, quote, by hammering the mainstream media for its bias and double standards for decades, he said, he was among those who helped, quote, destroy much of the rights immunity to false information. One of my aha moments in 2002, uh, I've been thinking about this idea a long time, came when President Bush's mastermind, whom we all remember, Karl Rove, told a New York Times reporter that, quote, people in the reality-based community believe that solutions emerge from judicious study of discernible reality. That's not the way the world really works anymore. He said this all with a smile, but he was deadly serious. We create our own reality, and while you're studying that reality judiciously, as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's how things will sort out. And you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. Back then, what I call full fantasy land had just blossomed, but the journey here, as I say, was much, much longer, which is why my book is a 500-year history. Jay Johnson, when I told him the title the other night here, said, wait, America's not 500 years old, and that's, I said, and is true, because I begin with the beginning of Protestantism, which is important to my story and our American story, which, of course, it's now 501 years since Martin Luther began that tale. But to, to the point of that, that Donald Trump is, is a, a symptom of this, not the cause, I started working on this book uh, uh, two years before he ran for president and finished before he was nominated. He is, as I say, a florid symptom. And to understand what's happening, how we did get here before Donald Trump, what Donald Trump took advantage of, we need to follow these historical threads all the way back to America's beginnings. Because post-truth, post-facts, alternative facts 
All of these are just the extreme extrapolation and expression of attitudes and instincts that have made America exceptional, very much for better, but also now we see for worse for its entire history. Consider the very beginning, around 1600. The first English colonists were all believers in this new individualistic anti-establishment species of Christianity, Protestantism. English Protestants, and again, it was less than 100 years old when, when they started coming to the New World. English Protestantism had already spun off this more zealous, extreme subspecies, Puritanism, and then a sub subspecies of even more fervent zealots, the separating Puritans, which in turn spit out a smaller, super extreme expatriate subset, whom we know as the Pilgrims and other Puritans who came here and began creating America. Now, at that time in Europe, the Middle Ages had ended a century before. The Age of Reason was underway. Shakespeare, Galileo, Descartes, Newton, belief in biblical end times prophecies and Satan were fading fast in Europe, but not among these extreme Puritan cultists, really, who moved to the New World wilderness. They took the Bible as literally as anyone on earth, really believed in, an, in imminent end times, thought Native Americans were Satan's agents, and that Satan had turned some of their fellow colonists into witches. Certain ultra-Protestant ways of thinking, uh, and I don't by that mean wearing chinos and, and, and drinking gin and tonics, but certain ultra-Protestant ways of thinking and feeling became defining American habits of mind. And not just the religious particulars that we see as though 60, it's still 1600 in so many of our uh, evangelical and fundamentalist fellow citizens, but and not just the people that, the things that most people agree are good, like the work ethic. I mean the extreme chronic antagonism to the establishment. That's what Protestantism was. Certainly what our initial, original Protestants were, the Catholic establishment, the English establishment. And really antagonism to all establishments and even to reasonableness itself in a very self-righteous way. To me, this deepest, most, enduring influence of American Protestantism, and it is specifically American, has been the permission it has given to all Americans to dream up their own versions of reality and to believe them with passionate certainty, to feel the truth, as I say, on any subject at all. Now, the other Americans, there are rather the other English settlers who came here, who at least I in school was not taught very much about, who came at the same time to the South were not such religious zealots. Their fantasy was getting rich overnight, having been convinced in England that America was filled with gold and silver for the plucking. Year after year in Virginia, for decades, a generation, more than a generation, they failed to find any gold or silver, and hundreds of them died, but they kept believing and kept telling their brethren back in England that there was surely going to be gold and silver here. So despite all evidence, more people kept coming and failing to find gold. According to the historian Walter McDougall's great history of early America called Freedom Just Around the Corner, most of the 120,000 people who sailed to the south in the 17th century did not know what lay ahead, but were taken in by the propaganda of the sponsors. The great historian Daniel Borstein goes even further, went even further when he was writing of early American history, suggesting that in general, quote, American, civiliza American civilization has been shaped by the fact that there was a kind of natural selection here of those people who were willing to believe in advertising. So America was created and built by true believers and passionate dreamers and by hucksters and their suckers, which has made us unusually susceptible to fantasies. For most of its history, America had a kind of dynamic equilibrium between various kinds of realists and various kinds of fantasists, between moderation and mania, skepticism and credulity. For three centuries in culture and religion and politics and economics, the fantasist and realist impulses existed in a, in a rough balance with a powerful animating tension between the two. That dynamic balance was key. America was like 
an internal combustion engine, uh, this great machine powered by endless little explosions, every idiosyncratic vision and dreamy ambition allowed to ignite, but with control mechanisms in place, carburetors and gaskets and a, and a sturdy engine block that all kept the thing from blowing apart. Such as the US Senate, which of course was invented to be the sober check on a potentially crazed House of Representatives. And the Electoral College, designed to be sober, wise men with final say on presidents in case the people, as Alexander Hamilton said, elected a charlatan or demagogue with talents for low intrigue and the little arts of popularity. Various extreme sects emerged in, a, em, emerged in America, but then calmed as they grew and matured or disappeared. We submitted our faith in free markets to constraints so that the system was fair enough to continue operating successfully. Conspiracy manias popped up, but until recently, each one then fairly quickly disappeared. Medical charlatans thrived for a century, the 19th, it was the great golden age of quackery, but then we created the Food and Drug Administration. Dream the impossible dream, build it, build it and they will come. Put the pedal to the metal, let your freak flags fly, but play by the rules and don't drink and drive. Sure, being an American always meant having a chip on your shoulder about the elite know-it-alls, but when push came to shove for three centuries, the know-it-alls who actually knew important things remained in control. And most of the time, this worked okay. But little by little, then during the last half century, more and more and faster and faster, Americans have given ourselves over to all kinds of magical thinking. Anything goes, relativism, and belief in fanciful explanations, small and large fantasies that console or thrill or terrify us. Partly, it's as I referred to earlier, our, our now dominant uh, version of, of evangelical religiosity. And we are real outliers in the developed world in this sense. More than, more than any of the other one or two billion people in the developed world, Americans do really believe in the supernatural and miraculous, in satanic demons among us today, of reports of recent trips to and from heaven, uh, of a story of life's instantaneous creation several thousand years ago. At the turn of this, but the fantasies don't end with religion by any means. At, at the turn of this millennium, the financial industry encouraged the fantasy that risky debt was no longer risky. So many, many non-rich Americans believed they could live beyond their means, given our fantasy that real estate would always and only increase in value. We fantasize that the government and its co-conspirators are hiding all kinds of monstrous truths from us concerning assassinations, extraterrestrials, the genesis of AIDS, the 9-11 attacks, the dangers of vaccines, I could go on. We stockpile guns because we fantasize about our pioneer past or in anticipation of imaginary shootouts with thugs or terrorists or tyrants. How widespread is the promiscuous devotion to the untrue in the United States? I went through reams of survey research from the last 20 years and, and assembled uh, thereby a, a rough census of misguided American belief and delusion. By my reckoning, the more or less solidly reality-based are a minority. Maybe a third of us, but almost certainly fewer than half. Only a third of us, for instance, believe with some certainty that CO2 emissions from cars and factories are the main cause of Earth's warming. Only a third of us are sure that the tale of creation in Genesis is not an absolutely literal factual account. On the other hand, more than a third of us believe not only that global warming is no big deal, but that it's a hoax perpetrated by a conspiracy of scientists, government, and journalists. A third believe in angels and demons, and a third believe that the pharmaceutical industry has in league with government hidden evidence of natural cancer cures. At least a quarter believe the following, that vaccines cause autism, that Donald Trump won the popular vote, that our, pre that our previous president was the Antichrist, that, quote, the media or the government adds secret mind-controlling technology to TV broadcast signals, and that witches are real. Remarkably, only one in five Americans consider the Bible to consist mainly of legends and fables, the same number who believe that U.S. officials planned the 9-11 attacks. 
And when I say that fantasy acts or uh, that a third believe fantasy X or, or a quarter believe falsehood Y, it's important to understand that those are different thirds and quarters of the U.S. population. Although various fantasy constituencies overlap and feed each other. For instance, belief in extraterrestrial abduction, which ballooned in the 1990s, leads to a general belief in vast government cover-ups, which then leads to belief in still more wide-ranging plots and cabals, which can jibe with a belief in imminent Christian Armageddon. It is no coincidence that Alex Jones delivers crazy conspiracy theories and personally advertises quack medicines. Fantasyland, as I call it, operates kind of like the European Union, where the inhabitants of any one of the regions are perfectly free to travel to the others like the Maltese can go to Iceland. Why are we like this? The shortest answer is because we're Americans. Because being American means we can believe any damn thing we want, that our beliefs are equal or superior to anyone else's, experts be damned, and maybe experts especially. Once people really commit to that approach, the world turns inside out, and no cause and effect connection is fixed. The credible becomes incredible and the incredible credible. And so we have the word mainstream, which has been turned into a pejorative, shorthand for bias, lies, oppression by the elites. Yet the hated mainstream, the establishment, the institutions and forces that used to keep us from overdoing the flagrantly untrue or absurd, media, academia, politics, government, religion, Corporate America, professional associations, respectable opinion in, in the aggregate. Over the last few decades, those institutions have actually enabled almost every species of fantasy to flourish within their various realms. A senior physician at one of America's most prestigious university hospitals promotes miracle cures on his daily TV shows. Major cable channels air documentaries treating mermaids, monsters, ghosts, and angels as real. A CNN anchor speculated on the air that the disappearance of that Malaysian airliner was a supernatural event. State legislatures pass resolutions to resist the imaginary impositions of a new world order or Sharia law. The irrational has become respectable and often unstoppable. And as particular fantasies get traction and become contagious, other fantasists are encouraged by a kind of cascade of out-of-control tolerance. It's, a, it's kind of a twisted golden rule. If, if they can believe that, then certainly I can believe this. Our whole social environment and each of its overlapping parts have become conducive to spectacular fallacy and make-believe. There are many slippery slopes leading in various directions to other exciting nonsense, and which have, in my view, been turned into a kind of huge bobsled complex of the last, uh, over the last few decades from which there is, it's difficult to escape. My, my history of this and my argument extends way beyond the, the clear-cut, fact-checkable untruths. America's transformation in this way really, really clicked into focus for me when I stepped back and, and, and broadened my, my vision and saw that the proliferation of illusions and delusions concerning large subjects that people have always debated, like science and politics and religion, is connected to... to the sort of the pop cultural glut uh, of the fictional and quasi-fictional that's also more than ever coursing through everyday life. So what I call fantasy land is not only a matter of these falsehoods, these fact-checkable falsehoods that are fervently believed, but also, also people attempting to assemble make-believe lifestyles. Both kinds of fantasy, the conspiracy theories and pseudoscience and belief in magic on the one hand, and things like fantasy, sports, and cosplay, and the rest on the other, make everyday existence more exciting and dramatic. And the modern tipping points for both kinds were the result of the same two momentous changes. The first was the profound shift in thinking that welled up in the 1960s. And before I get to that, 
In, at the very beginning of the 1960s, in 1961, right, as TV became ubiquitous and Disneyland had opened, again, the great Daniel Borstein published his extraordinary book called The Image, A Guide to Pseudo-Events in America. He wrote that we risk, in 1961, we risk becoming the first people, being the first people in history to have been able to make their illusions so vivid, so persuasive, so realistic that they can live in them. And that since we inhabit a, quote, world where fantasy is more real than reality, our national politics has become a competition for images or between images rather than between ideals. There is no way, he continued, to unmask an image. An image, like any other pseudo event, becomes all the more interesting with our every effort to debunk it. It seems as though he's writing about 2018. Uh, in 1961, about Trumpism itself. But the 60s, our popular understanding of the 1960s is skewed. People on the left focus on the legacies that we define as progress, civil rights and feminism and environmentalism and the like. And people on the political and cultural right, meanwhile, still tend to demonize the 1960s as the source of everything they hate. In fact, what the left and right respectively love and hate are mostly flip sides of the same coin. This is uh, the Atlantic Magazine uh, uh, ran an excerpt from my book on their cover uh, last fall, and, and this is the opening spread showing that, that this mixture of 60s uh, nests and, and various other kinds of uh, uh, chaos uh, all in one place. My point being that, yes, the 1960s, of course, the countercultural Woodstocky notions did explode then. But what people don't register, because we have this, this, this kind of narrow view of what happened in the 60s, is that so did extreme Christianity and conspiracism and survivalism and libertarianism and so much more, because the anything goes idea of the 1960s meant anything goes, that every individual was freer in every way to believe whatever she or he wanted. In the, in the 1960s, the idea that finally the American idea that finally eclipsed all competing American ideas was extreme individualism. After the 60s, equality for all of its beautiful realms of progress from that decade also came to include the idea that your beliefs about anything are as true as anyone else's. Which it's also when, the 60s, when big swaths of academia made a sharp turn away from what we'd thought of as reason and rationalism. The new paradigm did not abs didn't have absolute hegemony, but certainly got started and swept large fractions of the campus. The new paradigm was that rationalism and science, as much as fable or religion, are just stories made up by the powerful. Reality itself was said to be, and understood to be, a social construction, a collection of myths that members of a society have been duped into believing. Superstitions and magical thinking, now, in, in this new paradigm, could be just as legitimate as the supposed reality of reason and science. And the phrase consensus reality was introduced into the uh, lexicon and, and, and Google it. You'll still find it used in academic treatises uh, a lot. A great irony, of course, of this is that this believe or disbelieve anything you want ethos that emerged from the cultural left in the 1960s has ended up powering far more than any left the right in America. So um, the second big fantasy land enabling uh, change of all of our lifetimes came in the 1990s. Digital technology empowers all kinds of real seeming fictions of both types, the, the lifestyle kinds, uh, the entertainment kinds, as well as the political and pseudoscientific kinds. Because among the one billion websites in existence today, believers in anything and everything can now easily find thousands of fellow fantasists who share their beliefs with tons of pseudo facts mixed in with a few actual facts to back them up. Before the internet, crackpots were mostly isolated and had a harder time remaining convinced of their alternate realities or recruiting fellow crackpots. Internet search, it was designed to be democratic in the extreme, which means Gresham's law often operates, the bad driving out the good. 
The prominence that Google gives to any assertion or belief or theory depends on the preferences of billions of individual searchers. Every click on a link, which amounts to trillions a year, is a vote pushing that version of the truth toward the top of the pile of results. And exciting falsehoods tend to do well in this perpetual referenda and become self-validating. For instance, when I search for government extraterrestrial cover-up, the first three pages of results on Google include only one result that does not link to an article endorsing a conspiracy theory. Computers also make fantasies that we mostly understand to be fantasies seem much more authentic. Game worlds in which we can persuasively and immersively pretend we're anybody or anything from any time or galaxy. But we can also become exciting, fictionalized versions of our actual selves online. We see that all the time with real people interacting anonymously with other real people in these fantastical and often vicious ways that not long ago nobody would ever dream of doing. So each of these small fantasies and simulations that we insert into our lives is actually mostly harmless enough, replacing a small piece of the authentic here, another over there. But over time, these patches of unreality have taken up more and more space in our lives. And we stop registering the differences between simulated and authentic and real and unreal. In the old days, if you wanted to shot at becoming instantly rich, for instance, or wandering around a realistically make-believe place, you had to go to Las Vegas or Disneyland. Now, experiences like those are available everywhere. Back in the day, theme was not a verb. Pornography was not ubiquitous. We hadn't yet fabricated the mongrel of melodrama and pseudo-documentary that we call reality TV. Cosmetic surgery was rare. A 72-year-old man, 72-year-old men didn't dye their hair blonde, especially if they were planning on running for president. <laughs> of course, photoshopping your Instagrams, guilty, or playing Le League of Legends for hours and days on ends doesn't make any individual more inclined to believe she needs a dozen semi-automatic rifles for self-protection or that vaccines cause autism. But we are all more free than ever to custom make reality, to believe whatever or to pretend to be whomever we wish, which makes all the lines between the actual and the fictional blur and disappear more easily. Truth in general becomes flexible, kind of fungible, a, a matter of personal preference. There is a functioning synergy among our multiplying fantasies, the toxic as well as the individually benign ones. Scientists warn about what they call the cocktail effect, you know, about chemicals in the environment or, or drugs in the brain. The problem being that these various substances work together to potentiate each other in, in new and extreme ways. I think it's kind of like that, what we've been experiencing, that we've been drinking these bottomless American cocktails mixed out of all the various fantasy ingredients, the conscious ones, the unconscious ones, the semi-conscious ones, and each has intensified uh, and enabled the effects of the others. Thomas Jefferson tried hard to adhere to reason most of the time, with some tragic exceptions. One winter, for instance, in the White House, he had cut up copies of the New Testament of the Bible removed all references to all miracles, including Christ's resurrection, and pasted it all back together, entitling it The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. The one great book he wrote and published also addressed religion, advocating that the new American government that they were about to create lay off religion. Let people believe whatever, he wrote, because, quote, it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. I love that line because this is the essence of American shrugging tolerance. So what if lots of our fellow citizens have various screws loose today? So what if they stew in their own mad, mad, mad dream worlds? Ignore them, let them be. Yes, but the problem is when delusional ideas and magical thinking flood into the public sphere, become so pervasive and so deeply rooted that they affect us all. Some fantasies have become weaponized, literally. In other words, 
pockets are being picked and legs are being broken and worse, for instance, by fantasies involving guns and fantasies denying the science concerning climate change and vaccines and GMOs, and I could go on. But speaking of subverting science, consider evolutionary biology, which you can hear an entire presentation on by an actual expert later today. The effective takeover of the Republican Party, as my Republican mother used to tell me in the, in the 90s as it was happening, by fundamentalist Christians, happened gradually during the 1980s and 90s. But then in the end, very quickly, like, like a phase change when, 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 a, when a liquid changes to a gas. A decade ago, 2008, when all the Republican presidential candidates were asked on a debate stage if they believed in evolution, Three quarters said, yep, I believe in evolution. But in the next cycle, 2012, only a third were willing to say that biology was correct. And last time in 2016, one. One Republican candidate dared to say that evolution is real, and poor Jeb Bush, didn't work out so well for him, backtracked it immediately to saying, well, it's my belief, my personal belief, but I don't think it should be taught in public schools, and by the way, if you teach it, you should teach creationism alongside it. That's how quickly this happened and how extraordinarily. The United States has been politically, very politically polarized uh, before those of us who were alive in the 60s remember the 60s. But this, I think, is new. What's happening is more profound and more dangerous because we have become epistemologically polarized in a way I'm not sure we ever have been, with tens of millions of people embracing distinctly different version of reality and how truth itself can be determined or whether it can be determined. So to finish up, my 50-word my summary of how we got here, mix extreme anti-establishment individualism with extreme religion, mix show business with everything else, let all that steep and simmer for a few centuries. Run it through the anything goes 1960s in the internet age. Voila, the America we inhabit today where reality and fantasy are weirdly and dangerously blurred and commingled. And yes, dangerously. After Hannah Arendt escaped Nazi Germany in the 1930s as a young woman and became one of the great political philosophers of the age here in America, her first big book she published in 1951, just a few years after Hitler and while Stalin was still in power. It was called The Origins of Totalitarianism. I read it, uh, having not read it when I was assigned it in college, I read it only uh, in 2016 for the first time, and, and one paragraph really gave me goosebumps and left me breathless, and I will finish by reading it for you. Uh, 1951, Hannah Arendt. In an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and that nothing was true. The totalitarian mass leaders based their propaganda on the correct psychological assumption that, under such conditions, one could make people believe the most fantastic statements one day and trust that if the next day they were given irrefutable proof of their falsehood, they would take refuge in cynicism. Instead of deserting the leaders who had lied to them, they would protest that they had known all along that the statement was a lie and would admire the leaders for their superior tactical cleverness. Our post-fact fantasy land tendencies were present, as I've said, from the beginning, but this current situation was not inevitable because I don't think in history, as in evolution, anything is inevitable. Nor is any particular future inevitable now. We are at a crossroads, it's clear to me. We have choices to make. We might regain our national balance and composure. These last decades could turn out to have been this crazy phase, this unfortunate episode in the American experiment that we will move past and maybe our children, if not us, will chalk up to experience. Nations and societies, we could all name them, have survived and recovered from far more horrible swerves. But, I, all I can say in terms of the good news is that we may now be in America at peak fantasy land. And I hope we find that that's to be the case. Thank you very, very much. And I'll, um, thank you. Um, and thank you. If uh, there are, there's at least one mic and maybe another one over there that I don't see. And if any of you have questions about this 
set of ideas or anything else you didn't hear or anything else, I'd be happy to entertain them. Oh. Oh. Okay. So, yes, besiege me with your questions. I would welcome them all. Thank you very much.